First, I want to thank Michelle for letting me borrow her laptop. Um, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm from Orlando, Florida, uh, so I'm here for uh, like a week going between a few cities in, uh, in New York, and I really appreciate being able to pack light uh, for this trip. Uh, and I knew that there would be enough nerds here with laptops that I could just borrow one to give my presentation. <laughs> um, so uh, thank you all for sticking to the end of uh, WordCamp Rochester. My name is David Wolfhaw. I'm going to be talking about starting your own newsletter. Um, a little bit of background about myself. I've been involved in the WordPress community since about 2011. I've been doing uh, professional web development for uh, a few years longer than that. Um, and uh, when it comes to newsletters, I have managed newsletters for a variety of clients, uh, for several companies that sell products directly, uh, sell services, or uh, just have the newsletter itself be the product uh, as far as, new as, far as news related newsletters. Um, and I also just enjoy doing it on my own. Uh, I used to run one specifically for technology news. Uh, now, personally, the one that I have on my slide here is just a personal uh, weekly share about myself. But it's the one I feel like promoting, not for any of my, not my client ones, because you don't need to get their emails. You can get mine. <laughs> um, and uh, outside of that, professionally, I do WordPress maintenance for a living uh, at my company, Fix Up Fox. Uh, and I'm also here today on behalf of SiteGround, one of the sponsors, um, who actually has their own email marketing service. So uh, what I plan on covering uh, over the next short presentation is, uh, first of all, if you have not started your own newsletter, why you might want to start one, um, giving you some ideas about what you should write about. Uh, there's a few different personae of uh, newsletter types and newsletter writers uh, that we'll go over. Uh, I'm going to show you a few different tools for newsletter creation. Chances are you've heard of most of these tools already, uh, but there's a few specific to WordPress that you might not have heard of. Um, I want to show you how to set up a WordPress-based newsletter. Now, I'm not going to give you a step-by-step -step tutorial because one, that would just exceed the amount of time that we have for a presentation here. And also, pretty much every newsletter service both has its very particular setups, but also uh, a lot of things are the same. So. One, it would be repetitive, but two, it would be, you know, if you don't use that specific tool, it wouldn't apply to you. Um, we're going to talk briefly about where you'll find subscribers, when you should send your newsletters, and finally, once you have all of that going, who should you talk to when you want to build that up? Uh, I was always taught when it came to writing uh, news-related newsletters that, you know, you need to ask those uh, five W's, and I'm going to try to answer them all here. Uh, so there are four groups that I want to talk about because these are ones that have specifically uh, been useful for me when I've been running newsletters. Um, those are building out a business. They are so you can stay independent, uh, doing them for personal enrichment, what I currently do, and also for finding your community. Uh, and I'm going to have some just example screenshots of a few of them that I personally receive because I also subscribe to a ton of newsletters. Um, it's how I consume most of my content these days. Newsletters plus RSS feeds are my form of social media. Um, you know, I'm not going to be seeing the links that someone has on their Twitter or Facebook, but I'll be getting them right to my inbox. Um, I'm sure you've seen all the different stats about how sticky newsletters are, how much more open rates are and click rates versus people uh, seeing your things on social media, how it's more likely once you get people on your uh, newsletter sign up that you are able to sell things to them. Um, so let's assume that you've gotten to that point. What are you going to do with your newsletter? Um, if you already have a product, for instance, uh, I love to paint little war game minis. Um, I, I think I mentioned I'm a nerd earlier. <laughs> uh, and uh, so I've already purchased things from this company. Uh, so I get their regular newsletter, and uh, it, it helps them maintain a connection with me. I get to see the new products that they are doing. Um, it shows that uh, they you know, value their customers. Um, later on in their newsletters, they also show uh, galleries of some of the things that their customers have painted. Like we can submit our own pictures to them and they show them off in their newsletter. Um, and I uh, unfortunately have spent more money <laughs> after getting these newsletters, um, which for the company itself is certainly what they're going after. Um, you know, maybe that's not the best for my wallet, but uh, it's still, it's nice that I feel a bit more of a connection to it um, and that I get to 
learn about things that I know I'm already interested in. Uh, you know, if somebody gives you their email and signs up for your newsletter, they already have indicated some interest in what you're doing. It's a lot easier to make a sale to somebody who already has expressed, yes, I, you know, I want to know what you're selling. Um, there is a uh, wonderful podcast uh, series that I love called Flash Forward. Um, that podcast actually just ended recently, uh, but the creator of that podcast, uh, Rose Eveleth, she writes books. She has written some TV shows. She do, has a lot of different projects. And the main reason that I know about any of the projects that she has is that she maintains a regular newsletter talking about the things that she's doing. Um, so she's able to directly connect with her audience. She runs, a, uh, she runs this newsletter as a paid subscription so that you can get uh, more information about what she's doing, join into a, a, an exclusive community where you can um, you know, interact with her, and share in her work and offer your own feedback on her work. Um, and she was also able to build a personal brand with this. Uh, so if you are focused on doing something for yourself as opposed to for another company, uh, you know, having a newsletter is a great way for you to build up your own brand as opposed to having to build up somebody else's. Um, I found for myself, I'm able to you know, talk to people who know me from WordPress events, for instance, uh, and uh, you know, for better or worse, I'll say reputation or name precedes me uh, with, with those specific people because they already have seen me elsewhere online. Um, what I'm currently doing myself outside of my regular work uh, for clients is I'm doing newsletters for personal enrichment. Uh, this one here is an example of a newsletter for, from a WordPress developer uh, from Canada named Aruba Ahmed. Uh, she uh, writes about uh, what she's doing in WordPress development and that's kind of what I try to do myself as well. Um, it's a good way for me to clarify my thinking. So it's a good way for me to, you know, if you, if you start having an idea and then you start explaining it to somebody else, sometimes you have that, like, that spark of, oh, I didn't even think of that until I started telling someone else. I've had that same experience writing. Um, I also get to keep in contact with friends. Uh, I, I get regular responses when I write my weekly newsletters. Um, I will, I will uh, shout out somebody, uh, Ali Nimmons, uh, who's not here, but a lot of you might know her. She responds to my newsletters like almost every week. Uh, and it's great because, like I said, I'm not on most social media, so at least I get to keep you know, connection with somebody. Um, and it's a really uh, good way for me to keep in touch, know what's going on with people in a more direct way than just you know, kind of being that drive-by. Hopefully you see it when you're scrolling your, uh, with your feed on whatever social media platform. Um, I feel like you get a bit deeper connection than just you know, hitting like on someone's post when you reply to their newsletter. Which, by the way, if you're regularly reading newsletters that are from an individual, you know, that aren't just from a company, uh, hit the reply button. Uh, I love getting the responses. I know they do as well. And it's, uh, it's really nice just to have a real indication, I'm reading this. I like the thing that you're doing. Uh, and uh, the final one, uh, that, the final reason to write a newsletter that I want to share is finding your community. Um, I apologize for the weird AI-generated image that looks really creepy. That was literally the, this week's episode of the Garbage Day newsletter, which is one of my favorites. But also, since he's discussing internet culture in his newsletter, it's always something bizarre and weird. Um, there are so many things that I learn about that... Honestly, I wish I didn't learn about, <laughs> but, also, but also I get to have an idea of, uh, of you know, what's going on uh, with internet culture so that whenever someone shares with me a meme or something going on, I'll at least you know, be a little more educated about it. Um, I also subscribe to this newsletter in part because it's a very good community that's built up. It's a lot of people who are interested in the same types of things I'm interested in. Uh, it's a lot of people who do the same type of development work. So it's people who work on the internet. Uh, and so it's a really good way to meet and talk with other people. Um, that's, a, that's a separate topic entirely, but building that community around, uh, around your newsletter, around the work that you're doing, is a great way to find new people and kind of like work together. Um, I, I've literally, in, in this case, I've literally gotten paid, uh, a paid client from his uh, Discord through this newsletter um, and been able to talk about some of the things that I do you know, for a living there. So presumably you uh, are in here because you have an idea that you want to start a newsletter and maybe you already know why you might want to start it, whether it's for your business, for yourself, for your own clients. Uh, so you're going to need to choose what you want to write about. 
Um, myself personally, I talk about what I'm doing in my life, uh, but I also talk about my business a bit. Since mine's a more personal newsletter that I'm sending outside of my work newsletter, um, I don't really talk about business a ton there. Um, but when I would send them for uh, my business and when I send them for my clients, I try to make sure that they focus on their industry expertise, the things that the people who are subscribing to them want to hear. Um, so, you know, if I'm talking about for myself, I will talk to my friends about, you know, painting minis and the weird things on the internet. Uh, when I'm working with my clients, we don't really send that in the newsletters because that's not what their clients are going for. Um, you know, one of my clients right now has a newsletter that they send out, which is more for informing their, uh, informing their customers of their new products coming out. So I'm not going to share, you know, here's what the people are individually doing at home, but they give me ideas on uh, what new things are coming up in their industry. They attend a lot of industry events, and I get to uh, kind of condense that and share it out so that their customers know where they can find them, um, you know, when they have new things going on. Uh, sometimes they do have uh, discounts and promotions going on that we can share as well. Uh, basically, it's just trying to figure out whatever it is that your uh, audience would be most interested in. Uh, you know, again, for my personal newsletter, I don't really have anything to promote that I'm like, here, go buy this and here's a coupon. Um, but certainly for some of my clients, that's been a good way to drive new sales. Uh, there's a lot of different tools that you can use. Um, I have personally used most of these ones myself. Um, I say most of because there's actually the second WordPress one uh, is a newer one from Automatic that... Uh, is uh, very useful, but I haven't personally used. Um, I'm sure you've probably heard of tools like MailChimp and Constant Contact uh, and Substack. Button Down is one that I find is the one that fewer people have heard of because it's more uh, developer focused. Uh, by that I mean the way that the one person who makes it sells it is more for, uh, oh, here's an API you can use and you can also write in Markdown and here's how we handle sending and things like that. So. He's certainly talking to a more developer-focused audience, um, but it's a similar tool to the others. And then as far as WordPress tools go, um, there's a, quite a few different newsletter sending tools uh, that you can find uh, by the plugin repository. Um, all of the ones that I listed here have free plans, and then normally you just pay for more emails that you send. Uh, whatever tool you use, the main purpose of a newsletter tool, in my mind, is sending those emails not from your own domain. Um, you know, because most hosting companies will not look too kindly if you try sending hundreds or thousands of emails uh, from your personal account, and you'll probably get flagged for spam. Uh, so for the average company, uh, for all of the non-WordPress tools there, uh, those ones handle email creation and email delivery. Uh, for the WordPress tools, they handle email creation within your WordPress site, which is my preference. Uh, and then you will use some other third-party attachment, probably to one of those uh, ones on the first list to actually send them. Um, the tool that I personally use on my site, I did not list because they recently did a price change that has priced them out of, uh, out of me recommending to the average uh, person. Um, the only reason, I mean, I don't, I, uh, not to talk negative about a company, but the reason I still use them is because I'm grandfathered in. I also wouldn't be able to afford their uh, new pricing, their more enterprise pricing, just to send out personal newsletters. Um, but also, it would be, uh, I'd be remiss not to mention that the company that I'm here with, SiteGround, has started an email marketing platform. Uh, it came out just about two months ago. Um, you can do it directly from your hosting account if you have SiteGround hosting. And uh, if you are interested in looking at their marketing tools, you can find that at siteground.com slash WordCamp. Um, it's, it's very much like, again, like a MailChimp or uh, Constant Contact. You can create right from there. Uh, but the nice thing is if you already have a hosting account, it's already connected right to it. Works with your website. Um, so two of the popular WordPress uh, newsletter building tools, uh, I put screenshots of what they look like when you're editing up here. Because uh, I wanted to make note that uh, Newspack, uh, which is uh, actually both of these are owned by Automatic, uh, who runs WordPress.com. Uh, but Newspack is one that they built, uh, a newer one they built like for newsrooms uh, that you can build with the block editor. And by default, uh, I just opened it up and I just said, give me the default template. So I could show that it used a uh, recent picture uh, that I had 
in a blog post from WordCamp US. Um, I don't even know if you can see it from here, but you're up there. <laughs> but it's one of the pictures I took from our, our colored hair picture, our <laughs> dyed hair picture, sorry. Yeah, that was, well, it's really small too. <laughs> Uh, and there's Michelle in the middle, but um, yeah, uh, so uh, that one just by default pulls up some uh, content, you know, if you just want to share your recent blog posts. Uh, the other one, MailPoet, has been around for quite a while and is actually part of WooCommerce now. Uh, so one, if you use WooCommerce to do sales, there's a lot of integrations into it that can automatically send emails to people based on uh, if they've made a purchase or not. And if you have any promotions going on, you can automatically have them sent to your mailing lists. Um, so if you, if you happen to use WooCommerce already, that's a great one to look into just because it already integrates very heavily. Uh, the one negative that I have for MailPoet is um, at this point, having used the full site editor and the block editor for so long, it admittedly feels a bit outdated to have to like drag widgets in and use the, uh, the old editor like that. Um, I, it takes a lot more time for me to edit my newsletters there, but they do send very well. So you've decided that you're going to create a newsletter. You've chosen a tool that you're going to use. You started setting it up. Where are you going to find subscribers for your newsletter? Um, for me, the way that I find most subscribers for my personal newsletters was to promote on my social media page and uh, you know, basically on my social media accounts, Twitter, Mastodon, things like that. Uh, and also having signups easy to find uh, on your website. Um, I also just want to make sure that people know who I am. Uh, by that I mean, you know, for my personal one, I'm not going to be like, oh, you all have to subscribe to this. But by all means, if you want to, please go to my website and subscribe. Um, and uh, but I, I, what I try to do is uh, incentivize that people share my newsletters. Uh, at the end of all my newsletters, I have a message with an easy way to forward it to other people, um, which will also include a link to the sign-up page. Uh, I have RSS set up on mine because I know a lot of people who just want to get the content and not have to worry about it coming to their email inbox. For me, it doesn't really matter if it goes to the inbox or RSS feed, you know, as long as people are reading it. Um, for my clients, they have it set up where people will uh, get, have the ability to sign up for the newsletter when they sign in for forms, sorry, when they do contact forms on the website. Um, make sure you are doing things like double opt-in and you have people specifically opt-in to a newsletter. Uh, not only is it, uh, not only is it against uh, a lot of things like, for instance, GDPR to automatically opt people into a newsletter, but also you're going to get a lot of people who are upset that they don't ever remember signing up for it are going to hit unsubscribe or hit spam. And in the end, that's going to do a lot more harm for you than if you just uh, you know, ask them in the first place. I would much rather have you know, 10 people who want to read what I'm sending as opposed to 100 people that don't want to and end up uh, marking as spam. Oh, uh, which application? Yeah. Um, I'm using uh, I'm using a plugin called Newsletter Glue. Um, it's it's very similar. I would compare it more to Newspack than to a MailPoet. They they work very similarly. Um, I just really I really enjoyed it. I really enjoyed working with the team there. Um, but earlier this year, they happened to change their pricing model. They mainly focus on enterprise clients, uh, which is not a bad thing for them. But I also cannot uh, just you know say you should all use this for a tool that I personally also it's just a bit pricier than I would pay for uh, sending personal newsletters. These newsletter applications <coughs> Yes, these newsletter applications do have analytics that you can look at. Um, some of them have analytics built right into them. Some of them have analytics with whatever third-party sending application. So for instance, the one I use uh, is called Newsletter Glue. It does not actually send the newsletters. It creates the newsletters. I use that to create newsletters via WordPress. And then I have it connected to a third-party newsletter sending service to uh, actually send them out to people. Um, in which case, whichever service you have, whatever analytics that they provide. Uh, I personally use a tool called Sendy. Um, it is a self-hosted one that uh, sends email via Amazon. It's, uh, it's like a one-time fee that you buy it, you set it up, and then um, you pay monthly to, for Amazon, which uh, Amazon's email sending service is you're going to spend... Um, under a dollar for every like thousand emails you send, it's it's very cheap uh, to send it. Uh, most other platforms, uh, let's say like Mailchimp or something, they have um, I believe 500 free uh, subscribers. 
something like that, and then 2,500 uh, free newsletters or emails sent out per month. Uh, and then they start pricing based on how many emails you send. That's most platforms. Um, just going back real quick, uh, one like MailPoet, they offer their own sending service that you can use directly. There's, they give you 1,000 free subscribers um, and I believe 10,000 emails for free per month. Um, and then you know, from that, again, you would pay on from there. But if you don't want to use their email sending service, you can still connect it to a third party application. Um, and that's going to be most of the newsletter tools that you find. If they're not, uh, like any of them that I listed that are WordPress tools, most of them will have a MailChimp integration, a Constant Contact, AWeber, all of the large uh, other companies. So that one, if you're already using one of those other companies, you just have something to make your newsletters easier. Um, and then two, you just have your own options to you know, choose who you want to work with. Um, Absolutely. Yeah, so you're going to be able to get some data directly in, uh, in both Newspack and MailPoet as an example here. You can get some data from them directly, but you're going to get much more uh, fine-grained data from whichever sending platform you're using from them. So I'll get some, email, I'll get some info from MailPoet if I'm using um, MailChimp, for instance, but then if I actually go to my MailChimp account that's doing the sending, I'll get the much more fine-grained data. Um, so it really depends on, um, it depends on what data you're trying to get. Uh, I've been very happy with uh, the data that I get from Sendy. Um, it has a really easy to use dashboard that lets me see um, you know, who's getting it, where they're at, who's opening it, what are they clicking on, things like that. Uh, and I also like Sendy in that I can easily say that I want anonymized data only um, because I do want to get an idea of how many people are opening it. But I also don't really care about who specifically is opening it. I would rather just let them have their privacy for that. <laughs> um, but yeah. They want to know, sorry, where the what's donations? donations? Where from, like, ah, yes. So, like, yeah. Who's uh, willing to make the donation based on the newsletters that they're reading? Yes. Uh, you would just have um, some sort of uh, click tracking set up in the newsletter if you want to, sorry, to repeat um, the question for the camera, uh, being able to uh, get analytics tracking donations yeah. for, uh, for a client. Um, I would just have some sort of uh, tracking on the specific URL that they're going to. Um, most every tool here is going to automatically do it for every link that you have in your newsletter. And so you just choose you know, whichever link that you want to track. Um, and if you choose not to have anonymized data, you can get more fine-grained data about uh, you know, who's, what, what other links they're clicking on when they get there, um, where they're coming from, the people who are you know, opening it and clicking on it. Uh, for myself, I just want to see you know, what percentage of people are opening it, what percentage are clicking, um, and then you know, be able to see over time if that changes. Um, you can also use that to, uh, I don't personally use it because you know, my, my personal newsletter, I don't do this, but you can uh, use that data to then put them into specific funnels. Um, so all of these platforms have the ability to create uh, specific subscriber lists. Um, you can either integrate that with um, a third party tool if you've used like, uh, again, MailChimp, Constant Contact, any of those other big platforms, you've seen that you can have you know, a list of a thousand people, and then you can also put them into sublists. Uh, you can do that with these as well. And so you can say, you know, I only want to send this one to this specific uh, cohort. Um, and I'm not really, uh, I, I briefly touched on it, but uh, all of the ones that I've mentioned also have automated emails that can be sent. Um, you know, again, MailPoet's the one I focus on mainly because they have such strong integration with WooCommerce. Uh, that you can send a lot of automated emails based on specific WooCommerce actions. Um, which I know that uh, you were asking about donations, but I could say, uh, you know, my WooCommerce site sells uh, physical products and digital products, and I want to send a different type of newsletter for the people who, want, who buy something physical product from me versus digital, or who buy things based on this certain sale, or, you know, whatever thing is important for us to track. Um, so, something that does not actually have a clear answer is when should you send your newsletters? 
uh, because any advice anybody gives you on when the right time to send a newsletter is, is based on either a very specific uh, idea that they have or a very specific newsletter, or is just based on a feeling, I guess I would say. Um, so by that I mean I'm giving some ideas about when you might want to send them, but none of these things are hard and fast rules. No one has a great answer for when the right time to send is. Uh, it really depends upon your specific uh, subscriber list, and it really depends on what it is that you're talking about. Um, I mean, you know, I know that, uh, that the idea is that there's a lot of people who will just not get to all of the email that makes it to their inbox. Um, I'm going to read every newsletter that gets, or at least I'm going to open every newsletter that gets sent to me at some point or another. Um, but, you know, not everybody's like that. Uh, so, again, everything that I uh, say here, the ideas of, um, you know, what, what times you should avoid, if it's something that you're sending to people who are reading it on behalf of their businesses, maybe avoid the start and end of the week. Um, if these are, uh, if you're sending something that's more personal and that's for people who might have busier lifestyles, uh, avoiding the weekends. Um, again, all these things are not rules. They are general ideas. The main reason I want to stress that is I've seen so many people say, oh, you have to do this, you have to do that. And a big problem that I've seen is all of the people who will use uh, HubSpot or MailChimp or Constant Contact, all of them say, oh, send on Tuesday or Thursday morning from 9 to 11 a.m. That's the best time to get in someone's inbox. But they have so many people who follow those rules. They even have, um, if you use Mail, uh, MailChimp, they actually have... Um, a sending service that you can use, and not just to pick on them, but they have a thing that you can use that says, you choose the best time for me to send this. And like they randomize it a bit, but that just means that they're sending a large number of uh, emails from different companies at basically the same time. Um, you know, it's like if, you, if you're uh, deciding uh, when you want to drive somewhere, and you know that uh, during rush hour, it's when everybody is either going to work or getting off of work. Uh, and so you know, everyone decided they need to be on the highway at the same time. Um, it, it, it would be the same way. If you just listen to what these companies are saying and everyone does it, then it's going to make it even worse that you're all just going to send at the same time. Um, so what I would really suggest is A-B testing. Uh, this can be as simple as you just manually trying different times of day and different days of week. Um, and it could be more complex, you know, using the analytics and using a platform that will randomize sending times to track it. Um, also, these things don't really matter until you have a larger list built up. You know, if you have under, I would say, several hundred, a thousand subscribers at least, if you have under that, any analytics that you're going to get in terms of when the best time to send are probably not going to be causal. Um, that's one problem I find when people are trying to do any sort of analytics work that's based on such a small sample size, is that you're not going to get any very useful data. Um, and then I also want to talk about, you know, who you might talk to about building up your newsletter. Uh, so a lot of people um, will think I need to find other people who are in a similar field and, uh, you know, and share with them. And you might not know where to find those people. These are two services that I have used, findnewsletters.com and lettergrowth.com. Uh, both of them you can freely access and you can also freely uh, submit your own newsletters to. Um, since you can freely submit your own newsletters to them, it does mean that you're going to have to take a little bit more time to manually look through them, you know, to find people who are actually regularly sending out quality content newsletters. Uh, but anybody who puts themselves onto these platforms is also indicating that they are open to cross-promotion. Uh, look for somebody who has a similar uh, mailing list size to you, who is in a similar space, um, because it's one of those things where it's not really direct competition. If I'm already interested in you know, a specific topic, I'm probably interested in hearing about it from more than one person. Um, so you know, if, I'm, if I'm talking about uh, one of the examples I use was internet culture, I'm going to look for other internet culture critics to talk to. I'm probably not going to look for someone doing like um, uh, auto sales or something. You know, I'm not going to look for someone who's completely different in style. Um, but again, the reason I uh, suggest these two is because both of them are uh, free to use and free to view. But that just means you need to do more due diligence on your part. Uh, what I think is a lot better in the long term is to form one-on-one -on -one connections with other people. 
Um, sometimes it's really hard to do that uh, if you're doing this on behalf of a client. You know, I can, I'm not going to the trade shows that my clients are to make the kind of networking connections that I make here. Uh, so I can't go up to people and say, oh, hey, you're also in this industry. Um, you know, check out our newsletter. Uh, but if you're writing it for yourself, that's honestly what I would suggest doing. I spend all my time at WordCamps talking to other people about what we do for work. Even the other people who do website maintenance like me, I don't really consider competitors necessarily because, you know, you're going to find somebody who does something similar, but there's enough work to go around. Um, same thing, same thing here. Uh, I find that I'm not going to compete with somebody when we're talking about the same topics because it's much more likely we have audiences who want to hear from more people about the same topic. And that's everything I had to cover, um, but I have some time for questions because uh, I know you had a few, and if anyone has any other questions, please say, yeah. You're Sorry, you were slow. <laughs> no, you are slow. Sorry. Yeah. No, no, go for it. Sorry, you were quick. One of your recent slides said, consider writing guest posts for other newsletters. Yes. Most of the spam I get through my website <laughs> my form is, we'd like to submit a guest post to your site. Yes. So how do I become that person without being spamming? Uh, the question is, how do you write guest posts for someone else's newsletter? Uh, or how do you find people who will let you write guest posts without being spammy? Um, in my case, it has been, uh, again, through directly connecting with other people. Um, it does take more time, but if they know you as a person, you're more likely to be able to uh, do writing for them. Um, you know, I've written pieces for some WordPress newsletters, for instance, and it's been a lot easier for me to show that I'm a real person who knows about WordPress and has something to write about. Um, that's where I've personally done, um, uh, 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 done for other newsletters for uh, writing guest posts. I haven't done any for any of my clients because, again, I'm not you know, in their industry directly. Uh, I definitely, I, I agree, I wouldn't send out just a cold email to somebody if they have no idea who you are because that's the same kind of spam I mainly get on my forms too. I also love the emails that I get for uh, websites that either don't have a website or are not a normal website, like, um, like I host a Mastodon instance, and I regularly get emails there that say, oh, I want to write a guest post for your website. Like, you know, it's obviously it's spam, but I'm like, what are you talking about? There's no posts here. <laughs> Oh, I actually have something to add, too, that um, yeah. a good idea also is to go directly to their website if they have one and see if they have a form just for guest posts. When I was uh, at Master WP, I was the editorial director, and we had a separate form for you to submit if you want to write for us, and we also paid people, too. So go directly to the website. Yeah, uh, just to um, repeat that, uh, go directly to the website of a company that you might want a guest post for and see if they already have a form available for guest posting. And that's a great example. I do remember seeing Master WP would specifically ask people if they want a guest post. So the question is, what analytic tools would you use to work out what time to send uh, your newsletter? Um, like I said, I really wanted to stress on that one that that is something that I really feel that people place more importance on than there's benefit to. As in, um, most companies that say this is the best time to send, they're usually talking about maybe a few percentage points difference in clicking, uh, click through, which isn't nothing, but also isn't, um, there's no like, there's no magic trick for that. Uh, as far as analytics, uh, as far as analytics for that, most newsletter sending platforms you can do some sort of tracking based on when you send your newsletters. So by that I mean, um, I'm gonna use MailChimp as, as an example that I know that you can look and see your open rates based on days. Um, I, I, for myself, I simply just do it since I'm not using a separate platform. I'm using, um, you know, my platform has analytics built in. I just kind of look to make sure that there's a healthy click rate. Uh, what I'm defining by healthy is if I'm seeing that uh, the number hasn't dramatically gone down from you know, some other time, uh, which quite honestly usually just means that something broke in the newsletter. <laughs> um, so I guess my answer for what analytics you would use is, is whatever platform um, you're sending with has. Uh, a good portion of them allow you to 
search based on, t or not search, sorry, uh, view based on time of day and day of week. Uh, but I don't have like an exhaustive list of which ones do and don't. Um, most of them, they will present that right in like their sales page. Yes, the question is, will I make this presentation public? Uh, the answer is it basically already is public. Um, you can go to my newsletter page uh, to get more info. Um, I actually, um, I didn't have it prepared in time for this weekend, but I have a, uh, a guide that's basically this info and some other info with direct links uh, that I'm gonna be making as a separate page entirely. Um, but you can go there to get more info and I'm actually, um, now that the event's passed, I'm going to put this uh, up like as a specific link on that page as well. Um, I'm hosting. I host my slides directly on my own website, so that you can access them, you know, whenever there, um, as opposed to having to download them. Um, and uh, I just want to touch upon what you said about uh, making the time to do your own newsletter. Um, it can be challenging to make the time to add anything to your business. Uh, the one thing that I found most successful, um, and I'm talking on behalf of myself, not on behalf of newsletters that I'm doing for someone paying me to do them, because I think that's a good enough reason to do those ones. Uh, but the ones where you're doing them for your own business and you wonder if you have enough time for it, um, I just keep a document open that every time I have an idea, every time I have a link, every time I have something to add, I just add it there. It uh, reduces the friction of having to add it. Uh, when I say I keep a document open, I actually have it open in my newsletter um, editing uh, app on my website. Um, so I already have things getting added there. So when it comes time to assemble it, I've done you know, half the work already. Because uh, you're already thinking, oh, I saw this thing that I want to share or that I want to talk about, just remembering to write it down. Um, it certainly is a habit you have to form. Um, but when, it, when you do that, you know, it makes it take a lot less work to actually hit send day of. And, sorry, you had a question? Tracy, no? Change your mind. <laughs> Uh, can you be more specific about? So rather than question? going into your newsletter tool and ah. writing something specifically to be sent to your subscribers, you just take your WordPress RSS feed, have it convert to an email and sent. That way you publish on WordPress, yeah. it shows up on the website, and then it gets emailed to. Uh, so the question is, um, what's my take on RSS uh, newsletter campaigns where it takes the feed from your website and sends it directly to somebody uh, via RSS? Um, I personally don't do that myself, mainly because my thought is if somebody wants to, I mean, I think I provided a screenshot of my own, um, that, that green box there, sorry, I know it's probably a little small, the green box is literally, do you want to get this as RSS? Here's the link. Um, because for me personally, you know, if people want to get the info, um, whatever way suits them. Uh, so I don't want to just take the things that I posted and have it automatically send to people. Uh, that would get... I've subscribed to newsletters like that and I've unsubscribed from them because I'm like, I can read your stuff elsewhere if I want to. It's nice to know when someone updates, but it doesn't feel personalized. And for me, newsletters, uh, I want them to feel a little bit more personal. Um, I don't mean personalized like I'm gonna write specifically to you, but that I'm not just thinking, oh, you know, I wrote a blog post and I'm gonna just post links to it everywhere. Um, so what's the difference between the blue box and the green box? In this case, the blue box lets you uh, sign up to get it directly to your inbox. The green box is a link to get it for your RSS reader. I realize it's not exactly the question that you asked about having the RSS send them the, um, the posts specifically. Um, but isn't that semi -related. same content? Same content, yeah, but some people want to get it to their inbox and some people just want to use an RSS reader. Um, I actually do both because my RSS reader also ingests newsletters, but <laughs> not all of them do. But, but uh, not everybody, I've found that not everybody wants to, they want to have different contexts for when they're reading. Um, so, you know, my, my inbox should be, the context should be, here's where I'm doing work. And uh, for everybody, you know, not for everybody, that's where they also want to do their reading. Um, I know it's been quite a while now, but 
you know, however many years ago, something like eight, nine years ago, uh, Gmail introduced the different tabs uh, that you know are on by default when you set up your account, um, and it tries to you know automatically sort them based on where it thinks that should go. Um, that has done a lot to damage people's ability to get their newsletters uh, to the right people because not everybody checks all those tabs. Or you might go in and, uh, you know, again, I try to go into my inbox specifically for work. Um, and so I don't want those things crowding it up in there. I actually have a separate inbox that I personally use for all the newsletters I subscribe to, uh, different context. It's just, you know, I could do a whole presentation on how I manage email just because it, it's email's frustrating. Um, that said, I mean, that's, I've gotten the most value myself from every company that I follow through their newsletters as opposed to, um, I'm, I'm not going to see everything someone posts to social platforms. None of us are. You know, we know that the different, uh, every social media company prioritizes what they send um, and what people see based on whatever al their algorithm thinks. And uh, I, again, I would rather have a few people who subscribe to my clients' newsletters directly uh, than you know, more people that are on their social media because you're going to get a lot more engagement that way. Um, like when I look at my analytics for other social platforms, like when you can see how your, uh, well, when you could see how your tweets were performing uh, and things like that, you know, you'd get 1% of people see the things that you're posting. And then I look at my newsletters and you know, I'm getting 60% open rates. Um, I would much rather have that. <laughs> I think. I actually, I was say I think we have time for like one more. So. Uh, it's actually relevant to the slide you have up. How do you feel about pop-ups on your website? How do I feel about uh, pop-ups on the website? Um, uh, you know, it's funny. Actually, somebody uh, was talking to me earlier today about pop-ups uh, on the website for marketing, uh, which is the average person does not like them, right? You go to a website, you find the pop-up annoying. However, all your analytics are going to tell you, and every company is going to tell you, they, uh, they work so much better than not having them. You know, they do convert. So that's how I feel. That, that sigh is how I feel about them. They can be frustrating. I would make them personally not, um, not overbearing. Like, I'm fine if, with having exit intent. You know, when I go, that it looks like I'm going to go away from a page that a pop-up comes up, or if I'm there on the page, scroll down far enough, whatever thing. But I also don't personally want it like, uh, well, they have like the wiggle animations or anything uh, that just make them more obnoxious. Um, I'm sorry? Uh, if your browser choice is Brave, uh, which is a browser uh, that does some ad blocking of its own, among other things, um, I would. Make sure that you always have multiple ways for people to sign up for the newsletter. Actually, that'd be my that would be my advice elsewhere. Have them in your posts. Have them, you know, in the footer of your site. Um, I also have for some of my personal sites, since I have an archive, I have that dedicated page that I use a screenshot there. But I have multiple ways for people to sign up, uh, not just the pop up. But yeah, there's my long answer. Is that uh, I'm personally not a huge fan, but I'm also aware that they convert so much better than not having them. So. The, the advice that I would say is at least, you know, use that power for good and not evil. <laughs> yeah. You're not going to find one on my personal site because it's a personal newsletter. Like, I'm not, you know. But uh, I, I, yeah, I might use them for client sites. <laughs> um, if you are interested in uh, pop-ups for, um, for newsletters or for anything else on your sites, uh, there are some um, popular tools in the WordPress space. Um, there's uh, Optin Monster is uh, one that has a variety of different ways that you can get started uh, making pop-ups for your site. Again, they don't have to be for newsletters. They can be for other things. Um, and then there's also uh, a more lightweight one that you host directly on your site called uh, Pop-Up Builder. Um, it has a variety of extensions for it. Um, one reason I would suggest Pop-Up Builder for people is that uh, it starts free. And then moves up from there if you want to, you know, get other things. Whereas uh, the other one involves um, paying to use their API, like a monthly subscription. That said, I mean, you know, it's obviously worth it if it's for your business. <laughs> and I think that is, uh, yeah, that's time. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you.